Well, tonight we're going to continue our study in the book of Jude. And so if you'd like to turn there, feel free to do so. It's one chapter. Just go to Revelation and back up, and there you'll find it, okay? It's right before Revelation, the last book of the Bible. Hank Hennegraff recorded the following in his book, Christianity in Crisis. An elderly Benny Hinn follower was turned away from the entrance of, to Argo Stadium in Sacramento, California, because she had not given enough money to enter there. Later, while on stage, she was slain in the spirit, and while she was lying on the floor, a huge man, likewise slain, landed on top of her, breaking her leg. In 1993, in Basel, Switzerland, Hen prophesied over a man with cancer that he had many years to live now, but he died two days later. In Nairobi, Kenya, early in May 2000, four patients released from a hospital to a hen, attend Hen's miracle crusade died while waiting for prayer. Hank Canegraff wrote the following, People attend Hen's crusades hoping to see God move in a mighty way through an outpouring of miraculous healing power. After personally attending one of Hen's crusades, however, I can say from experience that the likelihood of being hurt during such an occasion is vastly greater than that of being helped or healed. I observed with great anguish scores of men, women, and children who could not even get near the stage to be healed by Hen. Hannah Graff described the scene as a survival of the fittest. He said, and I quote, those who attended the meeting in wheelchairs ended up leaving in the same physical condition. Some departed in tears. Others told me they left feeling that God neither cared for them nor had time to consider their needs. Apostates such as Benny Hinn, claim to be something they are not, and in reality, they do great harm to many, many souls. In Jude, we find uh, in verses 10 through 13, which will be the text tonight, we find him addressing apostates as he's been addressing for the first nine verses. The title of the series is Contending for the Faith. We as Christians must contend for the truth because the devil is not just, he doesn't just have people out there that are atheists opposing the faith, but he has people out there appearing to be saved, claiming to be saved, entering churches to distort and distract from the gospel of Jesus Christ and to lead people astray. The title of the message tonight is Apostates Described. In the previous weeks, I introduced apostates to you, and, and then we looked at some apostates condemned, and then apostates were uncovered and revealed, and tonight, apostates described. To define an apostate is, is challenging because apostates typically claim to know God, claim to be smarter and wiser than you, claim to hear from God in a way that you don't understand, yet they do not know the one true God. And then over time, apostates will reveal they are apostates, for they will claim that they don't believe at all. I shared in a previous week about Charles Templeton. He used to preach the Crusades with Billy Graham, but then departed from the faith. And Billy Graham had a crisis moment where he says, God, I don't understand everything about your Bible and what's in it, but I believe it and I will preach it. And Billy Graham went one way and Charles Templeton went another Charles Templeton went out from us because he never really was of us, as it says in 1 John. He is an apostate. But many times apostates have not come out and said, I don't believe. They claim to believe. Sometimes they are even deceived themselves. And they don't know who the true Jesus of the Bible is. So let's continue our study of apostates tonight. If you haven't been here week after week, I must tell you the book of Jude is very confrontational and it's uh, in one sense negative because it is Jude telling Christians to stand for the truth and oppose those who distort the truth. So it's very confrontational. So just be ready for that. Here we go, verse 10. But these men revile the things which they do not understand and the things which they know by instinct. 
Like unreasoning animals, by these things they are destroyed. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These are the men who have, are hidden reefs in your love feast when they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves, clouds without water, carried along by winds, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up their own shame like foam, wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. This is the word of the Lord that has been read. Let's now take a look at number one, the condemnation of apostates. The condemnation of apostates. Verse 11, Jude says, woe to them. He's telling the true believers, contend for the faith, but woe to those apostates. Woe to those that lead others astray. He's speaking of the horrible results and consequences that will come their way due to them leading others astray. Now, I need to prepare you for what's coming. Specific people will be called out by name. Jude does it here in this text. I'll I'll just jump ahead and show you that again. Uh, Notice in verse 11, they go the way of Cain. They've rushed headlong into the era of Balaam, and they've perished in the rebellion of Korah. Right there, Jude names three apostates. In the Bible, Paul also names apostates. Let me take you to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. Alexander, the coppersmith, did me much harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Now, when Paul wrote that to Timothy, Timothy knows good and well who Alexander is. And if there were multiple Alexanders, he knows it's Alexander, the coppersmith, right? And so Alexander is in the Bible for the grief he caused to the Apostle Paul, for the opposition he caused to the Apostle Paul. And so what I'm saying to you is, it is appropriate for me, the preacher, at times to warn you of certain people and call them out by name. And that's going to happen tonight. There's going to be some I will call out by name. There'll be some next Wednesday I will call out by name. Uh, Quite honestly, we don't have enough time tonight for me to call out everyone by name. Okay? But we see by example that I'm following the biblical example that Paul called them out by name. Jude called them out by name. And so I will give you some modern day examples tonight of people to avoid. Let's now take a look at the examples Jude gives us. First is the apostate Cain. He tried to earn righteousness through his works. It says in verse 11, Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain. Well, what is the way of Cain? Obviously, the first century reader knew the story of Cain. Well, you have to go back to Genesis chapter 4. That's the story of Cain and Abel, the sons of Adam and Eve. And Cain brought a gift to the Lord of his works. It was a result of his, him working the ground. And then Abel brought an acceptable sacrifice to the Lord. The Lord rejected Cain's sacrifice and accepted Abel, so what did Cain do? Cain, instead of getting right with God, after God rebuked him, he murdered his brother Abel. Cain was a religious man. Catch this. Cain was an apostate, but he was, he was religious. Most apostates are religious. They're claiming to be genuine followers. Cain gave to the Lord. Cain would cl- say he worshipped the Lord, but catch this, he worshipped God his way. You hear today, hey, it doesn't matter where you go to church, as long as we're worshipping the same God, they can worship their way, we can worship our way. That is not a true statement. We only can come before God God's way from the Bible. And so, Abel brought an acceptable sacrifice, shedding of blood. We know from Genesis chapter 3, after Adam and Eve sinned, God covered them with animal skins, which implies there was a sacrifice, there was death in order to cover them, okay? And then we get to chapter 4, and what is Cain doing? He's saying, look, Here's my righteousness. I've worked hard for this. I'm going to give it to you to earn the favor of God. You you need to take this because I was so kind to give it to you, God. 
That was Cain's attitude. And the Lord rejected it. Say, no, no, you don't get to come to God however you want. You don't get to fit me into your schedule or your timeline. You come to me as I say come to me. So let me just ramble for a minute and jump ahead in the Bible. When Moses has the people build the tabernacle, he gives them the exact dimensions of the tabernacle. The length, height, width, the exact pieces of furniture, the size of them, what they're made out of, the curtains, what they're made out of, everything is detailed. And no one can go into the Holy of Holies except the high priest on the Day of Atonement. One day a year, one man, and he goes in there and he sprinkles blood on the mercy seat to represent the sins of the people. Let me tell you something. They couldn't change who went in there. It had to be the high priest. And everyone couldn't approach God directly into into the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest could do that. There was a systematic system put in place by our Lord What I'm trying to say is someone couldn't just say, hey, high priest, I'll go in there for you. That wouldn't work. They couldn't do what they wanted to do. They had to do it God's way. Now we get to the New Testament and the veil of the temple when Jesus died was torn in two. And now we have all, we all, whoo, almost stepped off there. When (laughs) when we, when we, when we, now because the temple's, the veil's torn, we now have direct access into the presence of God. Anyone who places their faith in Jesus can enter into the Holy of Holies. But hear me, we still are to enter with humility rather than pride, saying, hey, God, aren't you glad I came and talked to you today? You know, no, he doesn't need us. We need him. Amen. We are to come before him humble. We are to come before him confessing sin. We are to come before him as he is the great I am. We are not. We are to come before him with the right perspective and the right attitude, with adoration for him. We have to come the right way. If you're with me, say amen. Amen. Cain came the wrong way. All right? So the second apostate is Balaam. Look with me in verse 11. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain. For they pay, for pay, they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam. Who was Balaam? Well, this story is found in Numbers 22 through 24 of your Bible. I encourage you to write that reference down if you want to read about it later tonight, because I'm going to try to summarize it here. But Balaam was a prophet of God that was hired in Numbers 22, verses 6 through 16 and 17, by Balak, the king of Moab. So if you don't know geography, over there you got the Mediterranean Sea, you got Israel. So you got Jerusalem here, and then the Jordan River is on the east side, and east of the Jordan is Moab. All right? And that's where Balak was king, was east of the Jordan in the land of Moab. And so he is having opposition. He has opposition with the people of Israel. So he talks to Balaam through his people and says, I want you to curse the people of Israel because they're my enemy. And Balaam won't do it. But then Balak offers him money. And so Balaam agrees to go meet with Balak. Well, on the way, the Lord stands in the way. The angel of the Lord, it says, which many times in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord is the pre-human Jesus. And he stands in the way. And that's where, um, if you know the story, Balaam hits his donkey. And finally, the donkey talks to him. Okay? It's one of, the, it's one of those texts. Okay? Um, the donkey says, why are you hitting me? What have I done to you? And finally, the angel of the Lord reveals himself. And Balaam realizes the donkey wouldn't go through there because the angel of the Lord is blocking the way. All right? And then he says, you, when you get to Balak, you say exactly what the Lord says to say. You don't say what you want to say. You say what the Lord tells you to say. But nonetheless, Balaam got bought off. Money. Some apostates, they're in it for the money. They go on television and they lead people astray to bring in the money. Okay? In Revelation 2.14, it references this story too. When, when John, inspired of of God writes and Jesus speaks through John in, in, in speaking to the church of Pergamum in Revelation 2.14. It says this, but I have a few things against you because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam and who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. So the error of Balaam has to do with immorality. It has to do with being bought off by Balak, the king of Moab. Speaking of being bought off, it says in 2 Peter 2, 3, in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. 
Church, I just want to warn you, TV is a wonderful thing. The Internet's a wonderful thing. It has allowed us to get the gospel to the, to the ends of the earth through, through online. It's it allowed us to do it in, in texting and in, in emailing and communicating with missionaries. It's been used in positive ways, but the devil has a counterfeit for every good thing. And apostates have an avenue they did not have when Jude wrote. Apostates can now reach you and reach me through the television or the radio. And they can bring in the money from people they've never met in person. Okay? And so beware. They will exploit you with false words. Let me give you an example. Creflo Dollar, he, he's... And these guys have been around a long time. I got no one that's really new. These guys have been doing this for a long time and still making bukus of money. Creflo Dollar is a mega church pastor. He's often on TBN station. And he said this in 1999. Well, you need to hear about money, folks, because you ain't going to have no love and joy and peace until you get some money. I think you have love and joy and peace when you know Jesus. That's what the Bible says, but Creflo Dollar, a preacher, says, I need to talk about money, and I need you to encourage you to give money because you're not going to be blessed. You're not going to have love, joy, and peace until you have money. Here's another quote for a moment. It doesn't have to do with money, but it just lets you know what he's teaching. He says, you're not a sinner saved by grace, you sons and daughters of the Most High God. You are God's. End quote. Oral Roberts, their basketball team just did well in the NCAA tournament. Oral Roberts, the father of the Faith Seed movement, called upon his followers to give $8 million by March of 1987. I mean, this is decades ago. $8 million by March of 1987. His call was, was given on January 4th of 1987. So, Two months, basically, or almost two months to get $8 million. He claimed that if $8 million was not given, then God was going to take his life. When the final day of February came around, he sent a follow-up letter announcing that the deadline to raise the $1.5 million, they were still short, was set for March 31st. How convenient. Roberts begged people not to let Satan defeat him. He said that God told him that he needed oral here on earth. That's from Hank Kennegraff's book, Christianity and Crisis, page 196. Oral Roberts is the same man that claimed that Jesus told him God had chosen him to find an effective cure for cancer. Roberts begged his followers to give, and they did. And when, with the money, he built a 20-story research tower. However, no cure for cancer has come. Folks, that's $28 million right there he's asked for. Beware of giving to men and ministry, ministries and causes that are not in line with Scripture. Galatians 6, 7 says, God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. Let's now talk about the third apostate that Jude shares with us, Korah. Korah had a problem with submitting to authority. So we got Cain trying to earn his righteousness. We've got uh, Balaam being bought off, gives into the money, and apostate Korah has a problem with authority. Verse 11 says, Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. The story of Korah is found in number 16. Uh, I'm going to try to summarize it, but it's all, I mean, it's like 40 verses of great content. Um, and so I'm going to try to do this as quickly as I can, but it is, need, it needs to be thorough to some degree. Korah was upset. He's a Levite, but he was not chosen to be a priest. And he was upset by it. And so he enlisted 250 men to oppose God's appointed leader, who was Moses. And in verse 3 of number 16, it says, They assembled together against Moses and Aaron. So, y'all need to know, here's a business meeting, but it's not a healthy one, okay? 
They, the whole congregation, they all assembled against Moses and Aaron, against their leaders, and said to them, you have gone far enough. For all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is in their midst. So why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? That's what Korah said to Moses and Aaron. Now notice, he is questioning whether Moses and Aaron should be in leadership positions. Who puts you above the assembly of the Lord? And then Korah is feeding the ego of the people saying, y'all are so right with God. Notice he says, the whole congregation's holy. Y'all are holy, he was telling them. Now, who doesn't want to hear that? Okay, so Korah was, was feeding their egos. He said, the Lord's with them and they're holy. Who made you so special, Moses? Well, God made Moses special. He pointed it him to be in the leadership position. So Korah opposed the authority placed over him. He made declarations about the assembly that was flattering to the people. Now number 16, verses 6 and 7, Moses said, do this. Here's Moses' idea. Do this. Take censers for yourselves, Korah and all your company, and put fire in them and lay incense upon them in the presence of the Lord tomorrow. And the man whom the Lord chooses shall be the one who is holy. You have gone far enough, you sons of Levi. We've got a confrontation going on here. You've gone far enough, he says. So tomorrow, we're going to let God decide, am I holy or are you holy? We're going put to put it to the test. Now, what did God do in response to the rebellion of Korah? What happened the next day? We jump ahead in the story to number 16, verse 31. As he finished speaking all these words, the ground that was under them split open. And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up and their households and all the men who belonged to Korah with their possessions. So they and all that belonged to them went down alive to Sheol and the earth closed over them and they perished from the midst of the assembly. All Israel who were around them fled at their outcry, for they said, the earth may swallow us up. Fire also came forth from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering the incense. Now, if you don't know how it ends, you would say, hey, Kor might be right. He, Moses might have been wrong. Kor is right. They're all holy and following the ways of the Lord. And Moses says, let's find out. Well, the next day, all 250 died, along with their families. And their possessions fell into the earth. And all the assembly got to see it. The assembly of the people were not right with God. But which, which do you want to hear? Do you want, let's just, just, just make up a hypothetical. I'm up here telling you, you know, church, we, we've got sin in our lives. We need to repent. And then another stands up, pastor, you're just way out of line, man. Y'all are holy. Y'all are wonderful. Well, wh who, which one do you want to hear? You want to hear the second one. And that's what Korah was giving them. That's what an apostate will give you. An apostate will deceive you. An apostate will flatter you. Hey, when you participate in my ministry, when you give to my ministry, God's going to do this for you. You give to my ministry, it shows how holy you are. That's what an apostate does today. Beware. Beware. So Cain, Balaam, and Korah are all three Old Testament examples that Jude uses to connect with the New Testament believer. Now, number two, the comparison of apostates. There are now five descriptions that Jude gives about apostates. The first one is apostates are like hidden reefs. Verse 12, they are the men who are hidden reefs in your love feast when they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves. So apostates enjoy fellowship with God's people. That's why we always have to be on guard. We always have to be on the watch because they love to be with God's people. Right here, he's saying, hey, among you Christians that he's writing to originally, he's saying there's apostates that come in and they're always at church with you and they sit down at your meals with you and they have no fear of you doing anything about it. This, this was probably very enlightening to the recipients of the letter wondering, all right, who's he talking about? Some probably knew, yes, we should have talked to them. But some probably didn't know it. But he's calling them out. Now, who's a well-known apostate in the Bible? 
How about Judas? Judas never had a heart after God. You don't see it for a long time, right? But he starts to show some signs of it, like when the woman pours the perfume on Jesus' feet, and he says, oh, that, you know, that could have paid for many people to eat. They could have taken care of the poor. And Jesus says, wait a second, buddy, you got the wrong attitude. And he goes into some other stuff, but basically he lets them know, she's worshiping me through that. So Judas was about money, and he didn't have a heart for people, and he didn't really have a heart for Jesus, although he traveled with him for three years, and he ends up, what does he end up doing? Being bought off for money, right? He is an apostate, but he was very comfortable sitting among the disciples, wasn't he? Very comfortable. Even the night after he betrayed him at the Last Supper, he's eating the Passover meal with them before Jesus says, go and do what you intend to do. And he leaves and he betrays Jesus and meets him later in the garden. Judas is an example of an apostate being like a hidden reef. What is a hidden reef? It's underneath the water. It's underneath the surface. Mariners do not like reefs because they that does damage to the ships and the boats but because the, they don't see it. It's hidden. That's how apostates are. They don't come out and say, I'm an apostate. They, they pretend to blend in. They pretend to be like everyone else and to believe the truth. They're underneath the service doing a lot of harm. They're like hidden reefs. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13 through 15, For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ, No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. Apostates disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Second description here, apostates are like clouds without water. Verse 12, they are men who are hidden reefs in your love feast when you feast with you without fear, caring for themselves. Clouds without water carried along by winds. Pretend for a moment you're a farmer and we're in the middle of a drought. You would be looking to the sky every day for a rain cloud. Every day. Praying and looking But apostates are clouds that never deliver any rain. They make promises they cannot keep. I read about one in the opening with Benny Hinn making promises he could not keep, telling men that have cancer, you're going to live for many years and dying two days later. Apostates are like clouds without water. But oftentimes they're very encouraging, they're very positive. Some apostates will talk all the time about how you can be the best you can be without mentioning Jesus. Please realize that apart from Jesus, the best you are and the best I am just is not good enough. It's not, it's not, it doesn't matter how hard you try. You don't want to be the best you. You want to be the best that God has called you to be. Submitted to his will for you. Let's go to number three now. Apostates are like autumn trees without fruit. Verse 12, these are the men who are hidden reefs in your love feast when they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves, clouds without water, carried along by winds. And then it says, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted. Autumn is a time when trees often bear fruit. Apostates are those that make claims but do not bear the good fruit. It says in Matthew 7, 16, you will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes nor figs from thistles, are they? Jude is calling apostates doubly dead uprooted trees that bear no good fruit. Fruit. Matthew 15, 13, every plant which my heavenly Father did not plant shall be uprooted 
And he's saying that these apostates are uprooted trees. They have no connection to the life source. In the Bible, sometimes we see that he is the vine, we are the branches, John 15. And so you, we, as, we as the branches get our source, we get our, to be provided for, it comes from the vine, it comes from the root system. But when you're uprooted, you don't have that root system. That means you're disconnected from the Lord. That's the picture that the Bible's giving right there. A fourth description is apostates are like wild waves of the sea. Verse 12 says, they are men who are, and then verse 13, wild waves of the sea casting up their own shame like foam. Jude just said that apostates are like the leftover seaweed and mess and foam from, from a storm. Basically good for nothing. That's how he's describing them. They pollute the minds, they do harm, but they have very little benefit to anyone. Benny Hinn that I mentioned earlier is like a wild wave of the sea casting up his own shame like foam. All the way back in 1991 on TBN, Benny Hinn said the following, Adam was a super being when God created him. I don't know whether people know this. Always take notice when a preacher says, <laughs> you've never heard this before. This is brand new. I mean, if I ever say that, uh, we're in trouble. Adam was a superhuman being. I don't know whether people know this, but he was the first superman that really ever lived. First of all, the scriptures declare clearly that he had dominion over the fowls of the air, the fish of the sea, which means he used to fly. Of course, how can he have dominion over birds and not be able to do what they do? The word dominion in the Hebrew clearly declares that if you have dominion over a subject, that you do everything that subject does. That's not true, by the way. In other words, that subject, if it does something you cannot do, you don't have dominion over it. That's not true. I'll prove it further. Adam not only flew, he flew to space. He was, and with one thought, he would be on the moon. You know, this man packs places out all over the world. Multi-millionaire. 50,000 people will cram into a building to be in his presence. And Adam flew to the moon and back. Beware, church, beware. Number five, apostates are like wandering stars. Verses 12 and 13, these are the men. And then verse 13 says, wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been preserved forever. Now notice Jude says where they're going to spend their eternal destiny. Black darkness forever. They're going to be eternally separated from the Lord in hell, in the place of judgment. But first he calls them wandering stars. If you go out tonight and it's not cloudy, you could see the North Star, right? Right? And you can see the North Star tomorrow night, right? And the night after that, because it's not a wandering star. You can see Venus, although that's a planet. You can see Venus pretty much night after night after night. Now, there might be some in the rotation that I'm not an expert on where certain times of the year you don't. But for most nights, night after night, you can see Venus or the North Star. But a wandering star, you would see tonight and then not see it again. It'd be like a shooting star. That's what he's calling apostates. Apostates come and go. They do their damage along the way, but they don't last. They don't make any, they don't have any long-lasting impact typically because they come and go. Fixed stars can be dependent upon. Wandering stars can only lead one astray. They don't stick around long enough to help. They only hurt. So hear me, church, apostates, if you haven't heard, if you've heard the previous weeks, you got a lot of understanding tonight, but if you haven't heard the previous weeks, and I don't know who that might be, then there might be a little confusion at this point. Apostates can be preachers. I've given you examples of preachers on television, preachers in churches like Creflo Dollar, where the preacher can be a false teacher leading people astray and professing to be saved but lost and is an apostate. Apostates can also be well-known 
people in Christian circles that aren't pastors of churches, okay? Benny Hinn's not a pastor of a church as far as I know. And there can be others. Apostates also can be lay people in churches. They come into the church, they claim to follow Jesus, but they lead people astray. And four out of every five things they say about the Bible are true, but you've got to watch out for the fifth one. And they deceive and they distort. And lay people can follow these same examples. For example, Cain tried to lead, he, he wanted to earn righteousness through works. Well, there can be people enter the church and tell you, look, to be right with God, do this, do that, do this, do that. And it's all about works. And they're, they're leading people to not have assurance of their salvation, which I preached on a Sunday recently, right? And then you got, you got people that can be bought off, and typically those are typically those in the profession of preaching, that for the sake of money they make claims that just simply aren't true. But then the third example of Korah was one of rejecting the authority of Moses, and so that could be a lay person in the church rejecting the authority God's placed here at the church. A pastor in the music ministry, Tim being over that, leading in that ministry, or Pastor Andrew in youth ministry, or me as the senior pastor. It can be someone coming in and saying, oh man, the pastor's always wrong, he's wrong about this, you, you follow me, you believe me, and they can be leading you astray. That's how a lay person can do damage in the local church, okay? So apostates can come in my position, they can come in your position, they can come in any position, uh, really. All right, so understand that. 1 Timothy 6, verses 3 through 5, anyone who advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing, but he has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words out of which arise envy, strife, abusive language, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men of depraved mind and deprived of the truth, who suppress, suppose that godliness is a means of gain. See, when you, when you study Scripture, if we can put that first Timothy back up there for just a second. When we study Scripture, we see Paul wrote about apostates and false teachers, false apostles to Timothy. He also mentions it, refer, he references it to some degree with Titus. We see it in the book of Jude. We see Peter writing about it in First and Second Peter. There's a lot written. Jesus talked about it a lot, false teachers and false apostles, which are apostates. And so it is all throughout the New Testament. And here, Jude tonight has given us three Old Testament examples. And so please realize apostasy is nothing new, but we can't pretend it's not real today. And as your shepherd that's supposed to love you and care for you and protect you, as my responsibility under God, I want to warn you, T, the station TBN is dangerous. I think I, that not, watching that station is not fleeing temptation. So be very, very, very careful. I find that that station, uh, whenever I've watched it, Nine out of ten times, there's been a distortion of the truth in the 30 minutes I've had it on. So, you don't need it. All right? God has, God has told us that you, you're fed through the Word. You can be fed through radio, uh, local radio. I think it's AM 640. Uh, I listen to that pretty regularly. There's great preaching on there. It's solid. Um, Daystar television station goes both ways. There's some good and some bad. TBN, I encourage you to avoid. And if that upsets you, we can, we can uh, agree to disagree, and I love you just the same, okay? But I'm doing my part to warn you uh, from my perspective. So beware. Apostates are like hidden reefs. They hide themselves well. Beware. They are like clouds of water and autumn trees without fruit. They make claims, but they fail to meet those claims. Beware, for they are like wild waves that bring about their own shame and will distort truth and harm you. Beware, for they're like wandering stars. They come and go, but rest assured, they intend to do judgment as they are going. They intend to do harm and bring judgment as they are going. So be on guard. Right here. You can know whether your life group leader, your pastor, the preacher on television or on radio is true 
by this word here. This is our authority. Adam was not a god because this says that he was a sinner. (laughs) Okay? And that's how you know. That's how you know. I don't know that that's the most encouraging message I've ever taught, but it's, uh, those are the verses we're on in the book of Jude. And so I'm supposed to, what does it say about the Bible? All Scripture is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And so Jude is profitable for all of those reasons. Let's pray. Lord God, you are wonderful. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the warning from your word. Help us to be faithful to you, to seek you, to identify false apostles, false prophets, false teachers, apostates. To contend for the faith, contend for the truth. You tell us, Lord, your word is the sword of the Spirit. So, Lord God, we take your word to go on the offensive and to contend for the faith. Be with us as we go, and may we rest on your promises, on your word. May the assurance of our salvation not come from works of righteousness, but come from your righteousness, where you have clothed us with your robe of righteousness through saving our souls. We've gathered to worship you and to study your word and to pray. We now scatter for fellowship, for ministry, for evangelism. Be with us as we go and help us to be salt and light. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.